You're listening to This Week in E-Commerce, the Ecom Nation podcast. Dive into the top online retail headlines with your hosts, Paul Waddy and Mal Chia. Let's load up the cart. This Week in E-Commerce, episode 23. I am Mal Chia and back with me is Paul Waddy. Paul, welcome back. Good to be back. Thanks, Mal. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Well, it's good to see you back in the uh, in the den um, after uh, yeah. after our interesting recording <laughs> in your backyard, which didn't quite work go according to plan. <laughs> yeah, we're we're back now, doing it better on other sides of the country. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. And uh, you were doing a bit of traveling last week. How was uh, how was that? Yeah, good. Went to the Gold Coast um, with the family, so it was good to kind of have a. Uh, I have a, br- a small break for a friend's birthday up there and tried to kind of do minimal minimal work, which was nice. But Gold Coast is beautiful, i got to say. Every time I'm up there, I kind of start looking around at, at houses and, <laughs> and, and and ask my wife if we should move, and then she just shuts it down instantly. So that's the, uh, that's the routine. Well, I guess like after the, uh, the, the time and effort you went into with your house, <laughs> you're currently in, like, yeah, you probably yeah. sh- you, we probably shouldn't want to move for a while, I'd imagine. Well, that's part of the reason I do want to move, <laughs> just the, the post-traumatic, you know, stress that I've got after building this thing. Fair enough. Fair enough. Look, I, I do like the Gold Coast a lot, and we are going to be back later this year for yeah. Retail Fest, which I'm Can't very, wait. very excited about. Can't wait. Yeah. So if you aren't planning to go to Retail Fest, please do check out um, the website about that. That's coming up in early April. Um, if I get my, if I've got my dates correct, so I think mm. about the fourteenth to fifteenth of April thereabouts. So Paul and I will be running two different workshops on the on the before the conference, um, and then a few sessions during there as well. But really, it's a great couple of days in the Gold Coast um, with the whole industry. You kind of locked in together, which is what I like. That you can't escape people <laughs> from the industry, so you get to make some really cool yeah. bonds. Yeah. With people. And Ecom Nation, our agency has a has a booth this year. So if you want to know what what Ecom Nation is all about, stop by and uh, stop by the booth and have a chat to the team. Mm, absolutely. In the meantime, I will be at Etel. So I'm presenting a couple of um, conferences. Sorry, a couple of sessions at Etel. Um, doing the day two keynote on understanding the value the the value perception gap, which I'm also doing a webinar on. Uh, by the time you listen to this on Wednesday. But we busy, are going to dive busy. straight into it. It's, we're very busy, very busy <laughs> early in the year. Um, and this is a conversation I've been having a lot with people about typically, historically, everyone says January, it's a quiet month, not much gets done. Hmm. I have done so much and everyone I know has been just flat out crazy busy, as I know you've been as well. Um, it's been a busy start to the year, just looking at um, the, the hive of activity. Uh, there's a lot of... Yeah, I think a lot of planning already uh, going into this year. Um, I don't know. It's sort of blinking and it's it's February. Talking to clients a lot at the moment about planning um, for the year ahead. January is an interesting interesting month. So I think um, it's a little bit tough going as we've spoken about in the past. So everyone's trying to get really busy for Feb and March. And there's a lot happening, Mal. To we're right into right into the thick of it. Mm, absolutely. Uh- Speaking of right and thick of it, we are going to dive straight into our first story of the day, which is about someone who I got to, I'm going to be fully transparent on this. I had a poster of her on my wall. <laughs> and I'm talking about Pamela Anderson. Um, she of Baywatch fame and many other things as well. Um, so Paul, did you have a poster of Pamela on your wall? No, but the, um, the red swimsuit was, was pretty iconic. And, uh, you know, for, for the younger ones listening, this is the original, um, Baywatch, not the, not the, the Zac Efron movie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, she is, look, Pamela Anderson was as iconic as it gets. Typical, mm. you know, um, American blonde bombshell and was absolutely enormous. And now probably also really known for her, uh, animal rights activism. That's right. Um, so she's, yeah, she's still very much relevant. Yeah. And well, actually, and, and she's actually done something very interesting, which is she has now taken a stake in Sonsi Skincare, um, which is a skincare brand, obviously, out of the United States, um, where it's a, they, they position themselves as being a minimalist skincare startup um, and who focused on clean, vegan and cruelty free skincare solutions. Um, now, she's coming on board as a co-founder and owner, um, which is pretty big, I feel, and something which you and I have talked a little bit about, which is the strength of creators now and the power they can bring to a brand, not just as a 
pretty face, mm-hmm. right, as a spokesperson or an ambassador, which is typically how they've been evolved now, but actually becoming truly part of that brand. So do you think this is just like a continuation of something we're going to see more and more? And I guess, what do you think about the fit between <coughs> um, a, a company like this and, and, a, and, and a celebrity like Pamela? Yeah, we've, this is one of our predictions, I think, for 2024 is just this, this, um, you know, uh, creators, not that she's a creator. She's like an original you know, act, actor or actress or whatever that right term is these days. Um, and has, has a very successful business career as well. Um, the, the thing I like about Sonzi, uh, this anyway, is the fact that it's a startup. So she didn't come along and just take a million bucks and like do a few ads. If you go and follow them on Instagrams, 20, you know, they're right in amongst where a lot of us are, you know, listening to this podcast, 20,000 followers, hustling, trying to get press out there as they've done. So good good on her for like getting into startup world. Um, but it does echo is exactly what we've been talking about, which is uh, these people that have a platform want to monetize that platform. Firstly, they want to start businesses, partner with businesses. So as as brand owners, um, we should be looking for people to partner with. There's big, big avenues um, big avenues, and and it's not always as expensive as you might think to work with some of these people, particularly if you work on a commission of sales. Um, the partnership seems great. Um, the partnership is like you know, uh, so minimalist skincare brand, cruelty free, um, right up her her alley. Uh, I think this is a good partnership. Even looking at the socials, like the way that they've gone about it, super organic. Lots of throwback photos of. Pamela and like lots of makeup free, uh, makeup free and that sort of stuff. Like the, 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 um, the social feed really seems to, um, hit the nail on the head here was as in terms of what they're going for. Love the partnership. Seems good. Love that she's gone into a startup and I kind of like that our prediction is uh, already coming <laughs> true of brands partnering with, you know, what do you call them? Ambassadors, creators, influencers, whatever mm. that word is. I think more of it needs to happen. I think we're going to see some good ones this year. This is a great one, I reckon. Yeah, I, I love it. And I think it's something which, you know, you, you can see the the change as well with these creators. I'm going to call them creators, celebrities, yeah. ambassadors, whatever you want to call them, right? Like yeah. actually understanding the value of what they bring to the partnership. Mm. And you can see that with like the, the, the Jake Pauls and Logan Pauls and KS ones, all the stuff they're doing. But there's really no bigger example of it than Taylor Swift, who has completely mm. owned her image now. Mm. You know, from the fact that she bought her, she re-recorded her all her songs from her back catalogue, so that she had both the recording and publishing rights to it. Um, yeah. She owns all her merchandise, all the sales from that. She, it's not she's licensing it. She is actually owns all of that, um, which is which is phenomenal. And you can see this going more and more with 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 people who do have this presence and understanding the value which they bring to a brand, and for a startup like Sonzi, like you said before, being able to align themselves with someone who A, fits their values and what they're all about, and B, can automatically instantly get them traction, particularly in a space like skincare, which you know, is extremely crowded. Mm. Yeah, it's, 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 it's up there with women's fashion in terms yeah. of the most po- um, populated, <laughs> but... Yeah, um, <clears throat> totally agree. Just looking at her feed now, she's like, I was like, I wonder if she's put it in her bio because, you know, it's genuine. It's the first thing you see, Pamela Anson, Sonzi skin. So she's got, obviously gone all in. And mm. you're 100% right about, like, there's a lot of artists at the moment trying to, like, claw back their, you know, their their rights to themselves, basically, and, and become business people. Mm. You're seeing that a lot with singers in the US, Taylor Swift and Jay Z's obviously done that so yep. well, and so on. And this is a big thing. Is like people, I think these guys are tr- guys and girls are trying to work out like I'm in control of my destiny, and they they realize people with big audiences and big followings can make serious uh, businesses out of you know um, finding products to match you know to match their following. And I think there's a huge opportunity to for brands to get out there and have a crack, tap some of these people on the shoulder, and do deals with them because they're. I'm telling you, like we're seeing it with brands. Big, big names wanting to do deals with brands. So um, th- consider making it part of your strategy uh, to reach out to a few of these people uh, in 2024. Yeah, fantastic. Now, our next article is a brand which we've talked about a few times uh, over the last 12 months or so. And it's typically been because they've been a bit in, been in a bit of trouble. Um, and the last time we talked about Kogan, we were talking about the fact that they were 
their net profit was declining. Um, that while their top line sales were increasing, their net profit was declining due to um, the, the the discounting they had to do to clear a lot of the inventory they were holding. Since we last spoke at that about them, probably last quarter after they released the last quarterly earnings, they've now had then recent quarterly earnings, which is the half. Actually, sorry, it's the half earnings for the half ending in December thirty one. So what they reported in this is that their Gross sales fell, declined 5.6% to 445 million, but their gross profit increased 42% to 89.5 million, and the gross margin improved by 36%. That's pretty damn impressive. Yeah, and a half. Yeah, I just stuck on that point. I think gross, it says gross margin improved to 36%, which is. Pretty low. Oh, 2,000%, yeah. Yeah, but, but uh, I think because they're obviously a marketplace as well, mm. so you, you take a clip of that ticket and it's light capital. So, yeah, so obviously they've moved to a light capital business. So, you know, that's great, like not holding too much inventory. I assume that means marketplace sales is a focus where you hold no inventory. It's low margins, as you see in that 36, in that 40 whatever percent. Um, but it's cash flow positive because you're not buying the stock. So I think mm. these guys, Russell and Cohen's obviously very very smart but I, I get excited when i see a business that falls 5.6 percent and increases um increases ebitda to 21.5 uh mil that's bloody good um so you know hats off to them for whatever they're doing because when your sales don't grow or even shrink but your profits rise it's a sign that you're running a really tight ship and mm. focusing on efficiency <clears throat> another thing that we talked about mal for 2024 which is like hey guys you know if kogan dropping five percent in sales that's not a bad reflection of kind of where we are right now and they've obviously you know super intelligent company they've obviously realized the focus is on efficiency and finding and gross profit which again is something we always talk about so i i kind of like seeing these big companies doing what what we're talking about now which is say hey this is the situation we're in of course we're going to keep trying to grow sales i'm sure they're still trying to grow sales but they didn't they dropped sales Mm. but they proactively focused on margin and had impressive results on EBITDA, something we can, you know, all learn from. Like this year, really d- doubling down on efficiency and profits. And you know, Co- Russell's not out there boasting about sales. Is, is, this is like profits. And again, as something we always talk about, people need to focus and talk more about profits than sales. Because if mm. you read the, if you read this based on sales, you'd be like, oh, Kogan's sales. If you posted their Shopify chart, they're not on Shopify, but it would be pointing down. You know, but their their profits and therefore their value has massively increased um, as a result of their efficiency. So again, let's let's focus on um, profits, gross profits, and efficiencies. Mm. And to go from a loss last year to a twenty one point five million dollar <laughs> increase huge. this year is gigantic. Yeah. yeah. So and like you say, it's like something which you, know, you you don't see everything just in like you know the the, the pretty Shopify charts. Yeah, but this is a sign of a business which is significantly healthier than what it was last year. And like you said, moving away from perhaps selling their own products, which, you know, obviously, yes, it's a higher margin, but, you know, to be fair, like the quality of it wasn't super awesome either. Mm. And also with the price of consumer electronics also dropping in the last 12, 18 months as well. Mm. You know, obviously during the pandemic, there was a bit of a shortage. So yes, the, the, the price of those did increase quite a lot. But in the last 12 to 18 months, as the market started to cool, the prices of them have started to decline uh, as well, probably due to an oversupply too. So when you see those things combined, it's like, well, let's get out of that business um, and look at something where we can be more profitable. And Kogan also have the advantage because they also, in many ways, they own the pipes. Like as a marketplace, mm. you know, even when they were selling their own products primarily, when they still had such a massive audience. You know, they were one of the first movers in the in the consumer electronic space. They've got a huge database. They've got so many great things which they can rely on that they can easily make the switch to this because they've just got that throughput of traffic cool. coming through who are going to purchase from them. Like, yes, they're going to purchase slightly less, but they're going to make more from each purchase. Mm. Um, and they're going to need to hold less inventory. Um, you know, their operating costs are going to be lowered, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which means that they can ultimately be more profitable. I don't think this will work for everyone because you, you got to own some pretty big pipes mm. for this, but it's clearly worked for them. 
Yep. And um, hats off to them. Good job. And just take note of the light capital business, guys. It's not always about, you know, it's cash flow is important as well. So mm. it's about not holding too much stock. Essentially is what we're saying. And we've seen, we, me and Mal, we've also spoken about uh, on the podcast, other businesses who, if you read between the, the lines, are discounting too much because they're holding too much stock. Their gross profit margins have increased significantly. They mentioned here it's a light capital business. Reading between the lines, reduction in inventory generally results in a reduction in discounting. It doesn't say that specifically in the article, but it would be interesting to know if a reduction in discounting has also driven that gross profit margin up. But anyway, hats off to them. Really, um, mm. really impressive story. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And the final story we're going to touch on is something which Paul and I are always very fascinated in, which is the stock markets. Um, and I always view this, the, the stock market as being a bit of a, you know, a, a barometer for how the economy is generally going. Um, and the big news, which I read this week, was to look at the growth in the US, where in the United States over the last 12 months, the S&P 500, which is the index of the top 500 shares in America, um, grew something like 40 to 50% um, over, the, over the year, which is gigantic growth, which means that if you invested in that basket of stocks at the start of the year, um, if you put a thousand bucks in, you would have fourteen hundred dollars now. So you would have had forty percent growth in that. Now, when you dig below the surface, most of that growth, about seventy percent of that growth, is attributed to seven companies, um, which is the, the 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 big seven of of tech really, um, which is Google, Amazon, Meta, Microsoft. Uh, who else? Um, Amazon. Yeah, Amazon, the Google, Amazon, uh, Microsoft. Sorry, I've lost, I've lost my link here. Uh, Apple, um, and, uh, uh, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix. I think it was there as well. Oh, yeah. I can't actually remember. Um, but anyway, <laughs> it was really driven by by seven big stocks. Um, God, I can't, I can't believe I lost my link. I should know this. Off I've the got the link, but I still can't find it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but this is just a sign. Of, but then I thought. Looking at this, that it'd be good to then look at how are e-commerce stocks going in comparison. Um, so I kind of pulled up what the stock market has looked like over the last year or so um, for some of the bigger e-com stocks, which um, which 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 we talk about a lot. So one which I'm going to start off with first is Shopify. Um, so Shopify they reached a high in 2021 as they all did. Then they very quickly came. You know, when the bottom came out, it fell out of the capital markets. But since then, they have rallied quite impressively. Yeah, so they're they're at their twelve month high right now, almost back at a hundred dollars. So far off their their all time high, which is one seventy, but still showing some some rapid growth there. So I think they've kind of bucked the trend. Instacart, um, we've talked about them previously in the past. They are a bit in free fall and they, they really only went public last year. They launched at $33 and they're now down to $26, which is following the same trend as Clavio. Um, but one which surprised me, which I looked at and we don't talk about very often is Global E. So Global E who, who facilitate a lot of cross border transactions. Um, so basically helping merchants in one country sell, sell in other countries without having to take on the, uh, the additional exposure and the, and the fulfillment and the logistics and things like that. Um, they actually have grown quite impressively over the last few years, where obviously after their drop, um, they've just been on a steady climb since, since the bottom fell out of their market in, uh, in 2022 as well. They're now from $18, they're up to, uh, almost $40 now. So showing like twice the growth. So I think looking at those different companies, like, what do you think is the difference between like a Shopify and a Global E versus a Clavio or Instacart? Like why have some con been able to perform well whilst other e-commerce stocks haven't been able to? And this is on the back of the fact that we're expecting like the likes of Yopo um, and SearchSpring to, to possibly list this year as well. So there's probably quite a few of e-commerce um e-commerce tech companies, enterprise tech companies, which, which are probably looking to list um, this in this next 12 months. So I'm just looking at this kind of like, well, what's the story? If you can work that out, Mal, you are doing very, very well <laughs> because um, there was another acquisition recently actually in Australia and I just can't for the life of me in the beauty space, I just can't for the life of me recall who it was. I was trying to see. Anyway, it was an EBITDA multiple of about five. And so <clears throat> the question you get you get when you hear these like e-commerce brands and, you know, it's like 
uh, the, the, the stock price is, you know, often about what you list at as well. So if you list at something that's just too high, then, you know, you're on a downward trajectory often. Um, so, the, the, you know, IPOs and so on, I've never really, there's so many factors that can manipulate whether prices go up or down. If we talk about, uh, you know, Aussie specific e-commerce businesses, this la latest acquisition I saw, and I'll try and remember the name, was about a five times EBITDA. A lot of business owners will be disappointed to hear that, Mal. And this was a profitable company. I, again, I will, I will find who it was. Um, but it's not like people are falling over themselves at the moment to buy shares in e-commerce businesses um, or, or to acquire e-commerce businesses. And then people will often point back to the Adore Beauty deals, um, you know, the BWX deals, which obviously didn't, you know, pr again, didn't go very well for BWX because they, they sort of overpaid and for other reasons. Um, but the reality is that these deals of like 10 times, 30 times profit or 10 times profit are so, so, so rare. I think um, ASOP was the one that people like po po mm. po point at and be like, wow, we can do that. The reality is like if you're an e-com business owner, you're probably looking at like profitable five times EBITDA pushing for seven. That that's the reality of the situation. Um, we're looking at the share the sh shares, and I'm like, just as you were talking, looking at my own. And Shopify's up sixty percent uh, from when I purchased it. Tesla's gone down. That was going great. Can't understand that. I can't claim that I even remotely understand the logic. Clavio, you know, we thought popped quite well, held quite well, and is obviously going quite well as a business, but the share prices decline. Mm. Globally, you made that point. It's a really interesting one. Probably doesn't have the, um, I guess, the reputation, at least in Australia, uh, as Clavio, although they're definitely, you know, they're definitely getting there, but that's doing quite well. Um, it's really hard. It's a really tricky space to know what's going on. And those seven companies that you mentioned, Mal, uh, in the article, the big seven, well, they kind of, you know, they're just a, a niche, aren't they? It's just tech. It's like mm. tech holding up everything. So it's pretty tough out there if you're wanting to do an IPO. It's pretty tough if you own shares. And it's pretty, honestly, pretty tough also if you're holding on to that, if you're running an e-commerce business that's probably not super profitable and holding on to a big acquisition. I don't know, Mal. I don't know if they're out there really. So again, the focus just becomes on like just run a good profitable business that generates a bit of cash for you. Hmm. So what I think is happening with the uh, e-commerce shares in particular when looking at Shopify is that Shopify own the pipes. You know, mm. Shopify are essential infrastructure essentially for, for e-commerce. Um, talking with, uh, with a, so many conversations I'm having with people who are on other platforms, um, just desperate to move onto Shopify. They, they mm. recognize that that's, that's the limitation of holding the business back. So they're desperate to move. Mm. So we're working with a, with a number of those brands at the moment and just trying to rapidly try to get them onto Shopify as quickly as we can. But that's mm. become the thing. It's like you've got companies like Meta, Alphabet, which owns Google, Apple, um, things like that, which, which, which are the pipes essentially. Like you need to have this. You can't not have Meta. You can't not mm. have Google in your business in some way, shape or form. So they've got this incredible moat, which is, you know, a billion plus users, which you just can't avoid. Mm. And I look at Shopify. I think Shopify is doing so well now because they've got the same. You know, they're, they're making themselves as easy to get it to access as possible, um, for, uh, for, for merchants. And so helping a lot of merchants get onto there at the moment. So they own the pipes because once you're there, you're going to be in that whole ecosystem. You start plugging in different Shopify apps. You start building more expansion stores. It's really easy to go and update your store and really take ownership of your store compared to like if you're on, you know, a WooCommerce or something like that or a Magento, which takes a lot of development costs. Once you're up and running, if you are using a standard theme, anyone should be able to go and manage it. You don't need custom development. And that's so appealing, I think, for a lot of merchants. So they're going to keep growing and growing and growing um, because it's so easy. And once you're in, you're probably going to be pretty locked in as well. Right? You rarely hear of people trying to get off Shopify into something else. At least I haven't anyway. Yeah, look, it's dominating. Like <clears throat> you rarely hear of anybody who's not on Shopify anymore when you meet a new business. Like you almost don't ask the question anymore. Mm. Um, but the, the, the owning the pipes is a really good point. And if you look at Shopify's roadmap for 2024 and what they've done historically is they've always attempted to do that. Uh, so, you know, like 
if consolidation of that tech stack, which is something we've also spoken about, like there's, there's not really the need to have so many different parts of your tech stack, uh, outside of Shopify or, or, you know, or within the Shopify app store, realistically, uh, you know, everything integrates with Shopify. You know, we talk about Clavio, bang, straight into your Shopify store, Akendo, straight in, gorgeous, straight in. So, um, Sure, they don't own those. Um, <clears throat> they, they don't own those pipes as such, but they've set, made it so easy to bolt onto your store uh, that it's kind of like they do own the pipes. Like it's mm. this is they're part of a, a tech stack in e-commerce that's almost unmovable and is growing so rapidly. And it's no surprise that you see a lot of other tech companies bolt straight onto that uh, success of Shopify. There's plenty of te uh, tech platforms out there who only integrate with Shopify because they're like, well, Shopify is the one. So, <clears throat> and I think it's interesting, like looking. At things like Shopify Collabs, the Shopify B2B, they are owning the pipes. They're like, oh, you do B2B as well. We've got you covered. You don't need to go outside of Shopify for wholesale. We've got you covered. You want to do partnerships with other brands in our network? We've got you covered through, th covered through Collabs. So I think they're kind of consistently, continually vertically integrating. They've, you know, owned things like Oberlo, had a crack at drop shipping. They've owned uh, stocky to have a crack at inventory mm. manager. I think they can do that better. They've even talked about owning the fulfillment network that they kind of didn't go but there. They sold the that business. Yeah, yeah, but they're always thinking about it. It's always like, how vertical can we go? You know, how much of this part? They've got Shopify shipping now, which means that like realistically, you could start a Shopify store and you really don't even need to call a shipping company. Uh, you do, probably will as a, when you get larger, but in Australia, Canada, the US, bang, yeah, yeah, I've got shipping sorted. It is all in they own so many of these pipes already and that's a massive part of it it's like yeah just speak to us we've got we've got your network covered so i think um yeah as we always say shopify not yet the biggest but that's absolutely still the fastest growing and then they're just always busy they're always evolving making it easier for merchants so it's no surprise their share prices um mm. has followed yeah, like I think the the, the real battle in the e-commerce tech space, and I mean like battle is going to be between the brands, the the other tech companies like the Clavios, Yotpos, Akendos, um, et cetera, who are trying to add a lot of this additional functionality through email, SMS, reviews, et cetera, um, to be able to bolster that because that's not the pipes. That's something which is is fairly easily substitutable between between them. So I think a lot of it is like how do you gain market share really quickly, which I think, you know, is a, a reflection of how the market sees that as well because they don't see a brand like Clavio. And, you know, we are Clavio partners and I, I love Clavio, love the brand, um, and it's something which I recommend very highly to, to, to all our clients if they aren't on it. But it's clear that how the market is looking at it is that they don't feel that there's enough of a moat there for a brand like Clavio. Um, indeed, when, when, a, when a Yopo or things like that also list, to be able to give them that that five, ten times multiple, which, uh, which, which, which I think, you know, we're used to seeing in the tech space going mm. back like four or five <laughs> years ago, even. Yeah, I think you're hundred percent right. You, you, you can, there are a lot of SMS email. <clears throat> These are really reviews. These are <clears throat> highly competitive spaces that there's quite a few options in, but it, it is absolutely getting to the point where you're in Shopify. It's like, well, I didn't really see other genuine options to move off. So mm. you do, you know, you do have this, ex you know, extremely loyal group of users um, and they can obviously just introduce new features to those users uh, who are not going to go anywhere. Mm. So yeah, hundred percent right. I think they've got that moat, um, which has got to be a, a factor in their value. Yeah. They're, 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 I think they're going to be the Apple of e-commerce. Yeah, we, yeah. Once you're there, they, you, you don't tend to leave. You don't tend to leave once you're in that Apple ecosystem. Agreed. Yeah. Once you're in the app store, uh, I guess the challenge becomes when they start rolling out their own apps. I think this is one of the criticisms yeah. of the app store that, Apple still charges a 30% commission for if you want to do a spreadsheet app, but they also have their own spreadsheet app, which doesn't pay any commission. So mm. there is a bit of like an antitrust element there. Um, mm. that's, that's something for the, uh, for, 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 for the courts to decide how they want mm. to deal with that. Um, that's well above yours and my pay grade mm. to, to deal with that sort of things. Um, yeah, but I, I do very much see Shopify, I think, becoming that Apple of ecom. Yeah. Good call. I, I agree. Fantastic. All right, Paul, that's what we've got time for. We are recording here on a public holiday. So what do you have going on for the weekend? 
Uh, pretty quiet day today. Do we, I'm going to try and <clears throat> get a few things done around the house, a bit of exercise today, go out with the family tonight for a uh, for dinner and just, um, <clears throat> yeah, enjoy being back in the air. It's very, it's very hot in Sydney. It's for, for about 40 degrees and humid today, so it's not an outdoor day mm. really. So um, pretty quiet one, Mal. What are, yeah, you, what are you up to? About the same. Got a, uh, got the traditional you know public holiday barbecue, which we're going to. Nice. And that's about it. That's about it. Taking it pretty easy, I think. We've got a, we've got a very full on next few weeks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I think similar to, to uh, Sydney, uh, it, it was 40 degrees earlier this week and then it was like thunderstorms the last two days. <laughs> it's, it's a, it, the weather's all over that's the place. That's the worst kind muggy. of weather. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Fantastic. All right, guys, thank you for listening. Um, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or Spotify, Shopify, no, Spotify. <laughs> too much Shopify talk. Yeah, too, too much Shopify. Yeah, uh, Apple, one of those Apple podcasts, YouTube, or or Shopify. Uh, in the meantime, we'll be back next week. Cool. Have See a great you guys. weekend.